All right, so let's take a look at the uh, behavior of the whole muscle. So the first is the all or none law. And this is where muscle fiber contracts completely or not at all when stimulated. So here, if we have an impulse that's below threshold, we have no contraction occurring, right? We get an uh, impulse above threshold, we're gonna have contraction. Now, I do wanna point out that the entire muscle does not obey all or none. As you can see, if we have a low stimulus, we're just gonna have a few muscle cells contracting. It takes a much stronger stimulus to get the entire muscle to contract, all right? All right, let's take a look at types of contraction. So the first is a twitch. And this is a single stimulus that causes a muscle cell to contract and relax. And so this is showing this like tension, you know, or contraction. So, you know, if we hooked you up to an electrode uh, and we isolate a single muscle, we send a single, single signal to that, your muscle would contract and relax, all right? And that's what we see here, this contraction and relaxation. Now, if we increase uh, the frequency, all right? So if we increase the frequency, so here's showing twitches, full relaxation. Now, if we increase the frequency of uh, impulses to that muscle, we're gonna to get to what is known as incomplete tetanus. So this is accumulation of twitches. So this is where the twitches occur so rapidly that the next twitch occurs before the previous twitch fully relaxes. So this is what we're gonna see. Instead of contraction, relaxation, contraction, relaxation, we would see this, all right? We're not getting full relaxation. Now, if we turn up the frequency even more, right, what's going to happen is that muscle will stay contracted. And this is what is known as complete tetanus. And so this is a maximum sustained contraction. And here, there is no relaxation. So what you would see with the muscle, if you turn up the frequency, is it would just stay contracted. All right, so that's what would be complete tetanus. Now, one of the things you might have seen here and here is this thing called TREP or TREP. It is a staircase pattern of increased strengths of contraction. All right, and so we see that on this next picture here. And this is even though the stimulus strength is the same, okay? So same stimulus strength, so stimuli of, uh, of, of constant strength, you're still gonna get a stronger contraction. And a couple reasons for this. One is there is more heat available, and our enzymes in our muscles work a little better there. And also there's more calcium available. So, you know, we have contraction and relaxation. So every time we have a contraction, we pump calcium out and then we have to reabsorb it back in. But if we keep pumping calcium out, you know, we get more calcium into that muscle cell uh, and then more uh, myosin combined to troponin, or, sorry, to actin, all right? Uh, the next thing is uh, muscle tone. And this is a sustained partial contraction of a muscle uh, this is going to stabilize joints and it's going to maintain posture and it keeps muscles ready to act. All right. So how uh, muscle tone works, uh, we have this partial contraction of muscle. This occurs by uh, rotating of the motor units. All right. So, you know, I've been standing for a little while, right? I've fallen over because my muscles get tired out. And the reason is my keep shifting, not consciously, but I keep shifting my motor unit. So let's say the blue motor unit was contracting before it goes into fatigue, which we'll get to uh, in a little bit. Uh, I shift to my red motor unit. And then before that gets into fatigue, I switch back to the blue unit and so on. And by doing this partial contraction, that uh, prevents muscles from tiring out. And so you can use them for long periods of time. All right. All right. So let's look at an isotonic contraction. This is a contraction in which a muscle changes shape. And there are three ty or, sorry, two types of isotonic contractions. One is a concentric contraction, and a concentric contraction is a contraction in which the muscle shortens. So in this flexion, she has that uh, barbell, she's bringing up, the biceps brachii is shortening. And so it's undergoing a concentric contraction, all right? Now, if she's bringing that barbell uh, back down, here, the biceps brachii is still contracting, but now it's lengthening. And this is known as an eccentric contraction. So an eccentric contraction is a contraction which a muscle lengthens. So in that extension, right, that uh, uh, biceps brachii is uh, undergoing an eccentric contraction. Now, I do want to point out, we go back to a concentric contraction of the biceps brachii, the triceps brachii back here are undergoing an eccentric contraction at that point. We go to this one, biceps brachii is doing a eccentric contraction, triceps brachii is doing a concentric contraction. 
Next is an iso uh, isometric contraction. And this is a contraction in which a muscle does not change in length. So if she's just holding that barbell there, muscles are gonna be contracted. Uh, they're not changing in shape. That's an isometric contraction. Okay, let's look at uh, muscle size. So muscle size, uh, so you know, if she continues to work out, she's gonna get hypertrophy. This is an increase in muscle size due to an increase in muscle activity, all right? What you're really doing here is you're increasing the number of myofibrils within your muscle cells. Next is atrophy, that's the opposite. So there's a decrease in muscle size due to inactivity. So here we're gonna decrease the number of myofibrils here. So we typically see atrophy if somebody's been in a cast for a while, they haven't been contracting those muscles, uh, so they will atrophy because of that. A specific type of atrophy, and it's a muscular disease, is called muscular dystrophy. So this is a disease that results in a progressing wasting of skeletal muscles. And what happens with these people with muscular dystrophy is they stop making a certain protein called dystrophin, which was named after muscular dystrophy. So this is showing dystrophin here. Now I know I didn't talk about it when we were talking about muscle contractions. You know, so there's a lot of stuff. I just, you know, it didn't seem like I skimmed over the top, but I really did. So dystrophin, it helps uh, get the signal down into the cell, uh, makes those contractions better. And so what happens with people with muscle, uh, muscular dystrophy, they stop making dystrophin, they don't get as good at contractions, and so these muscle cells will start to atrophy. So if we look at this cross-section, this is a cross-section of a normal skeletal muscle. Each one of these is a skeletal muscle cell. And you can see they're all fairly about the same size. This is a person who has muscular dystrophy. And what you're seeing here is that these over here are cells that have, uh, have stopped producing dystrophin. These cells are still active. And so what you're seeing is hypertrophy occurring in some of these cells and atrophy occurring in other cells. Long-term consequences of this is that all of these cells will eventually stop producing dystrophin and they won't be able to contract these muscles. So what happens long-term with people with muscular dystrophy uh, is they lose the ability to walk and then eventually it's going to affect their skeletal muscles that they use to breathe. All right, let's look at uh, energy metabolism. So let's look at energy sources for contraction. Uh, the first is just stored ATP in the cell. So we have ATP in our cells. It's not what we use for long-term storage. We're gonna use glucose and glycogen for that. Uh, but uh, we store about four to six seconds of ATP in our cells. We can replace ATP though. So when we take ATP and we break ATP down, we produce ADP and then phosphate ions, all right? So there's an enzyme in our muscle cells called myokinase and that will transfer a phosphate group from one ADP to another. So it's gonna take it off of this phos, uh, it's gonna take a phosphate from that ADP, put it onto that ADP, and that's gonna make some ATP for us. Also, our muscle cells have creatine phosphate, uh, which uh, will essentially donate a phosphate group to another ADP to make ATP that way. Now, we will burn out of our creatine phosphate. We only have about 10 to 15 seconds worth of that in our cells. Uh, once we burn through all these, we have to make uh, energy the old-fashioned way, and that's either through aerobic or anaerobic respiration. So in aerobic respiration, this is a breakdown of glucose in the presence of oxygen to make ATP. This occurs in the mitochondria, so we can see right there, occurring in the mitochondria. Uh, this is what we use for rest and light exercise. The byproducts of this are carbon dioxide and water, and it makes uh, about 36 ATP, 34 to 36. Anaerobic respiration is the incomplete breakdown of glucose without oxygen to produce ATP. That occurs in the sarcoplasm, so not in the mitochondria, and it supplies a quick burst of energy, but it produces a lot less energy. One glucose is only gonna make uh, two ATP, which they're not showing there. So only two ATP are made there. We typically use this for rigorous exercise, right? So here's the thing, and it sounds counterintuitive, that's because it kind of is, but when we contract muscles, we actually pinch the blood vessels that are delivering oxygen to those muscles. So the stronger we contract those muscles, like in lifting weights and sprinting, the more we pinch those blood vessels which are delivering oxygen to those muscles. So we aren't getting enough oxygen for those exercises, so we shift from doing aerobic re uh, respiration to anaerobic respiration to do those rigorous types of exercise. 
The byproduct of doing anaerobic respiration is lactic acid. So lactic acid builds up and that's gonna cause our muscles to ache and to fatigue. So uh, we'll talk about fatigue right now. So let's look at consequences. So muscle fatigue is where the muscles do not contract even though it is still stimulated. And this is due to a relative deficiency in ATP, not its complete absence, all right? So when we pinch those blood vessels, less oxygen makes it to those blood vessels, we have to shift to anaerobic respiration, and in doing so, produce lactic acid, and that acid uh, is gonna interfere with further ATP production. And so we just have to stop contracting those muscles. Next is a, uh, the next consequence is a contracture, and this is a state of continuous contraction. So here, no ATP is available, and so the myosin stays bound to the actin, and they won't detach until some energy is available. All right, so next is uh, oxygen debt. And so when you ever, you know, do a rigorous exercise or, you know, sprint or whatever, you know, when you get done, you'll notice you continue to breathe deeply when you're done with that exercise. So it makes sense that our breathing rate increases while we're exercising because we have a higher energy demand on those muscles. It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense why we continue to breathe deeply afterwards because we still don't, we don't have that higher energy demand. If we have a higher energy demand, we're gonna use more oxygen, uh, more glucose. Uh, if we're gonna break down more glucose, we need more oxygen, so that makes sense, all right? So the thing is, you can't get all the oxygen in that you need, and this is known as oxygen debt. This is the amount of oxygen required by muscle cells after physical exercise. We're gonna use oxygen to convert that lactic acid back into pyruvic acid, which is a usable molecule, and this is done by our liver, uh, it's also going to restore normal levels of ATP and creatine phosphate found in those muscle cells. And then finally, just oxygen levels that are in those cells, because we deplete that initially. Another consequence of uh, muscle contractions is heat production. So only 40% of the energy that's found in the glucose is converted uh, into ATP in aerobic respiration. The rest of that energy is lost as heat, and that's what contributes to our body temperature. 